Hey, so perfect day to start talking about water and water distribution. Uh, I'm going to start off, however, um, helping to settle some of the ideas associated with, with balloons and answer some of the questions that, that you all asked that I didn't get to last time. So just sort of remind you things that, that are important. In gases, there is this interplay between pressure, which, which is a, the fluid equivalent of force. It, it makes things accelerate. Between pressure and density, which is the fluid equivalent of mass, and temperature, which is uh, a measure of, of thermal energy. And because the, the, that interplay is, is, well, is useful, or at least present in your lives, things that you, that you, that you notice, let me just take a look at that, that relationship. The pressure of a gas is approximately equal to its den the gas's density times its temperature on an absolute temperature scale. So if you change temperature, you change pressure. It's, you know, they're, they're interrelated. And so some, some examples where things happen that you've, that you've seen before. If you take a, a rigid container, like a glass bottle with a lid, and you fill it with ordinary room temperature air and seal it off, you now have a certain, uh, you fix the density of the gas in that container. It's got the same number of molecules it had before, the same type of molecules, and its volume can't change because it's a rigid container that for all practical purposes has a fixed size. And so the density is fixed. As a result, if you play with the temperature, you necessarily play one-to-one -one with the pressure. So if you put it in the refrigerator and cool it down, the pressure goes down proportionately. Again, on temperature on an absolute scale, which is a little wacky, but live with it. So rigid containers, when you change temperature, you change pressure directly. And you've seen this happen. For example, you take the container, seal it at room temperature, put it in the refrigerator, the pressure goes, the temperature goes down, so therefore the pressure goes down. When you open that container, still cold, they go, you hear it, you hear it suck in air because it's below atmospheric pressure in there. It's okay? I mean, this is why you don't want to do the reverse. Put, put a sealed container in, in, in great heat because the pressure will rise above atmospheric and you, you, know, you risk blowing up the container. All right? If you, on the other hand, you use a non-rigid container like a beach ball or a, just a sack, a bag, a baggie, a Ziploc baggie, and you collect room temperature air. Now, because the bag has such a flimsy surface, or the balloon has a, uh, the beach ball has such a flimsy surface, it can't support differences in pressure between inside and outside. If the pressure were, were different inside than outside, the skin of the, of the beach ball would, would move. It would accelerate toward lower pressure, and the, the beach ball would get bigger or smaller. So, in this case, you have fixed the pressure inside the, the beach ball. I'll stick with one. Okay? It, it, it's going to be atmospheric pressure, give or take a little teeny bit. Therefore, if you play with temperature now, the density will change to, correspondingly. If you, if you lower the temperature, the density inside the bag will go up. Why? Because in order to keep the pressure constant inside the, 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 the beach ball, with lower, with lower temperature, that by itself would slow down the molecules and reduce the pressure. But the, but the beach ball won't, won't allow that pressure difference to, to, to exist, so it'll collapse and pack those molecules more tightly together. And so now you've got more mass in this. It, you've got the same mass in a smaller volume. You've cranked up the density. So this, this, you've seen this happen when you put uh, flexible, sealed, flexible things full of air in the refrigerator. They shrink because you slow down the molecules. They have to, 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 to draw together to summon up atmospheric pressure, higher density. And again, if you put it in, in a hot environment, uh, the, the, it gets bigger. To, uh, the density goes down. This was like with, the, with marshmallows. You cook when you roast marshmallows, you are heating up the air inside non-rigid bubbles. The bubbles swell up to, make, to, to remain at atmospheric pressure. And so you get these big puffed marshmallows. All 
All right, any, any questions about the playing with temperature, playing with pressure, playing with density? They show up in various places in life. Okay, um, back to, to, to issues of why balloons float. I told you that, that because of the Earth's gravity, fluids here at the surface of the Earth, that includes gases and liquids, develop pressure gradients. The pressure's highest down low where, where, the, where the fluid has to support the weight of everything above it. And in air, the pressure is slightly higher down here than it is up here, you know, almost immeasurably different, a tiny bit less up here, and so on. In water, that, that pressure gradient is much more severe because the weight of, because water's dense, got a lot of weight per volume too. And so uh, as you go up and down in water, the pressure changes dramatically. In fact, the Earth's atmosphere uh, goes from zero pressure at the top, whatever the top is, down to about 100,000 pascals here. It takes the whole Earth's atmosphere to get to 100,000 pascals. In water, if you go in water, uh, the surface of a swimming pool, let's make it a really deep swimming pool, the surface of a swimming pool, like a, as here, this pressure is 100,000 uh, pascals, uh, or also known as one atmosphere. So it's, this is one atmosphere pressure here, on top of a swimming pool, also one atmosphere. On top of this tub of water, one atmosphere. But as you start going into the water, uh oh the weight of stuff overhead begins to rise dramatically. And by the time you're 10 meters below the surface of the swimming pool, the pressure has gone from one atmosphere at the top to two atmospheres down there. So it, it doesn't take, this is like 30 some feet. Uh, 30, what, I don't know, 33 feet. You go 33 feet down below the surface of water and you go from one atmosphere of pressure to two atmospheres of pressure. And you probably, you know, if, if you've gone swimming and diving, you've noticed this, it, it affects everything in you that, that has gas. For example, in, in, in your ears, you, you, off, you have some amount of, of gas present and as the pressure on, around your head goes up, uh, the pressure on your ears goes up and the gas shrinks because it is, temperature is fixed and the pressure's going up. For the pressure to go up, the density has to go up. It packs tighter and tighter and you feel the stresses on your, on your ears. All right, so, so it's, this is the story behind uh, swimming and why your ears often hurt. So, okay? So the pressure gradients exist in any liquid and we'll, we'll be dealing shortly with pressure gradients in the story in water. But back to, back to air, so this, there's this pressure gradient, and as a result, there is Archimedes' principle. Archimedes' principle observes, and it's, it's sort of an amazing result. It's very simple, but, but, but wide-reaching. Wide that, that if you put something in a fluid here on the Earth's surface, where gravity's around, there will be a buoyant force upward on that object due to the surrounding fluid, and the strength of that upward force will be exactly equal to the weight of the fluid pushed out of the way. That means that if you push water, push air out of the way, you've got a little buoyant force because the weight of the air, say, in my hands is small. If you push water out of the way, the buoyant force is big because the weight of the water in my hands is significantly higher. So this is why people float. You know, what's holding up? It's the same buoyant force. You're displacing water and water has this severe gradient in pressure in it due to its density. And as a result, the water pressure at your feet, when you, if you're standing there, is significantly higher than the water pressure at your head. And there's more upward push than downward push, you're pushed up. And because our density, that is our mass per volume, is about the same as the mass per volume of water, the buoyant force on us when we're fully immersed in water is pretty nearly equal to our weight. We're, displ we're displacing water and so we get a buoyant force equal to the weight of the water, but we weigh about the same amount that, as that too. So the net force on us ultimately then is very small. Uh, we're almost fully supported by the water, give or take a tiny bit. And if you want to be better supported, take a deep breath, which increases your volume while barely affecting your weight. Now you're full of air, which doesn't count for much. So you, uh, you're displacing more water, therefore getting more buoyant force on you without really adding much to your weight. And so you can go across that boundary between being under-supported and over-supported fairly easily and so people can swim. Okay? 
So that's Archimedes principle. Uh, I will say one more thing, that it, 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 it is stunningly correct. So that, for example, a log floating on water, and what the heck is going on there? You know it floats a little out of the water. So it's displacing some water and some air. And if it's at equilibrium, zero net force, it's perfectly supported. It's, it's displacing a mixture of water and air that weigh exactly as much as it does. And the air counts in this case. If, if the air were denser for some reason, you put carbon dioxide there instead of air. Now the, the log and, and is displacing a mixture of water and carbon dioxide, uh, uh, that's too much. It, it's displacing more than its weight. It's oversupported and it will move up. And it will shift its, its equilibrium so that it goes back to displacing exactly its weight. And where does this show up? This shows up in boating and boats and tankers and stuff like that. They're all, they're floating just right so that they displace exactly their weight in a mixture of water and air. All right, I'll leave it at that. Why doesn't water go in your ears when you swim? It does, um, unless there's trapped air in there, which will build up pressure as the, as the water tries to go in there into, your, into a sealed pocket, say, with air in it. As the pressure builds up, as you go deeper, the water will push in on the air. The pre as the pressure rises, the density of the air will go up. So it'll pack the air more and more tightly. As you come back out, it'll unpack. Uh, that happens in your ears. There's, there are lots of stories with ears, but, um, but it also happens in your lungs. If you take a big breath of air and hold it and then go dive very deep, think what's happening. The pressure around you is increasing as you go deeper and deeper because you're, you're, you're exploring this, gra this gradient in pressure. And as it goes deeper, most of your, your, the parts of your body, for example, your hands and stuff, which have no gas in them to speak of, uh, don't notice. They're, they're being pushed harder on one side, but also harder on the other side. There's no net force that shows up as a result of this increasing pressure. And the materials from which your hands are made of don't change volume with pressure. They're, they're, they're solids and liquids, which in contrast to ga gases, you can't compress them. They're, not, they're considered incompressible. It, you don't, they don't change their volume as you, you can't, as you squeeze on them. So not much happens. But your lungs, that's not true. Your lungs contain a gas. And as the pressure builds up, the, that pressure builds up in the gas and its density increases. It packs tighter. So whereas you started at, at the water surface with a full breath of air, as you go down, you feel less full because the volume is shrinking. And if you go to these people who go down and testing depth records and stuff like that, by the time they're way down there, their lungs are basically completely collapsed. There's, no, there's no, almost no volume left to the, to the air in their lungs, despite having taken a full breath. It's just squished by the increasing pressure down to nothing. I don't even know how, I don't know how they deal with this, but they do. All right? Uh, Does the, does the air continue to, provide, uh, to contribute to the buoyant force pushing the log up? When the log is sitting partway in water, partway in air, the, the fluids that it is displacing always contribute. So if the air becomes less uh, helpful, for example, its, its density goes down because the, the day warms up and the air expands to, to occupy more space uh, because the, 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 each molecule is doing a better job making pressure. So now the air has less dense. Displacing it doesn't give you as much buoyant force. So the log is under-supported now. It's supporting this light, 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 fluffy stuff. Air, eh, doesn't count, hot air. So the, so the log will have to descend into the water because its mixture was no longer right. It wants a little more water, a little less of that light, fluffy air. And it will, it will manage to, to, to get back just the right buoyant force to hold it up. The air is still counting throughout this, this uh, situation, though. Is that okay? All right. Um, so balloons that float, and they're not, you know, most of them don't, of course, you blow a balloon up and it, and it because it contains air that's ordinary air at ordinary temperature, uh, it's got the same density as the air around, in fact, it, it's got a little bit higher density if it's a, if it's a, if it's a rubber, the rubber surface of a, of a balloon. 
So the density inside is too high. The weight of the balloon, therefore, is more than the weight of the buoyant force. The thing has a net force down, and down it goes. But if you can substitute, the, uh, strategically substitute different gases for, that, for the insides of the balloon, you can make it weigh less than, it, than the air it displaces. And, and I have flitted back and forth between talking about density and talking about weight. Let me make sure I, I, I sell that issue uh, properly. And that is that if the balloon itself weighs less than the buoyant force on the balloon, of course, the balloon's oversupported, it's going to go up. Equivalently, if the average density of the balloon, which is how much mass it has for its volume, is less than the density of air, that is how much mass per volume air has, that balloon will also go up. It's the same idea. Density is a measure of mass per volume. And mass develops weight here at the surface of the Earth. So basically, it's saying that if the balloon weighs less per cubic inch than the air weighs per cubic inch, there's a net upward force on it. Up it goes. So, you, so Archimedes' principle can be uh, talked about in terms of just the overall weight of the object and the overall weight of the liquid or the fluid, or the average density of the object and the average density of the fluid. One is the other divided by, you, 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 in one case, you're dividing by the volume. And you're also making the leap from mass to weight. So, but they, they go hand in hand. It's the same story. OK? Um, anything else? OK. So let me ask this question, just because I can. Great justification, but I'll do it anyway. And here's the, come on, question. This is a non-trivial result, so think about it carefully. If you take a balloon, a, a balloon full of helium, and you see how much it can lift. So that, you know, how much junk can you hang on that balloon before it's at net, net uh, force zero instead of net force up? So you, so you can load down the helium balloon. Take the helium out and put hydrogen in instead. And hydrogen, particle by particle, weighs half as much as helium. So the balloon now contains the same number of particles. And that's a, that's a point that I didn't emphasize this time. But, but if you substitute hydrogen for helium, uh, remarkably, you'll end up with the same number of hydrogen particles in now that you used to have helium particles in then. So having substituted heat hydrogen, how much stuff can you lift now? before you've weighted down the balloon until it's no longer able to, to have a net force up. You OK with the question? The question's other question? Where did the, where's the, the clicker mech? Sorry, I've got to go find the, the eye clicker thingy. There it is. Uh. OK, let me bring back the question. Poof. All right, not that one, this, this one. All right, see what, you, see what you think. Technology, love it. I'll give you till 30 seconds. And then I'll talk about it, because it's, yeah, you, you, you'll, you'll see where this is going. Three, two, one, zero. B is not the right answer. A is the right answer. So, you know, why? You, 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 you have the weight. You, the balloon, you, 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 yeah. Here's the reason. Start with the helium balloon, and I'll just put numbers in, just to, you know, approximate numbers, just, just for, for, for clarity. If the helium balloon weighs two units but displaces 10 units of air, Archimedes' principle says the net for, upward force on it is 10 units of, of, of weight upward. And it only weighs two. There's eight left over, right? There's an, there's an 
an excess of upward force from the buoyant force of eight units. Might be newtons, might be pounds, might be tons, something like that, okay? Now, let's take out the helium and put hydrogen in. Well, the helium used to weigh two units, and the hydrogen now weighs one unit. So now there's an excess of nine units between the upward buoyant force of 10 and one unit of weight. Nine units, not, okay? So the upward, so the, this balloon can now lift nine units of stuff. When it was full of helium, it could lift eight units. Now it can lift nine units. That it, what matters more than the weight of the gas that's in there is the difference between the buoyant force on the balloon and the weight of the gas. You don't care about the actual weight of the, of the gas. You care more about that difference. And the difference doesn't change very much if you go from one super light gas to another super light gas. Um, the difference between the weight of the super light gas, which, is, which you can say is zero, who cares? So you're, you're, you're the, the, you, it's that, it's, yeah, I can keep saying the same words, but I'm not getting any further. You okay with that idea, or somebody want to ask me a question about it? So the point is that hydrogen doesn't lift all that much more than helium. Uh, good news, hydrogen is widely available. You can make it out of water, if you like, with electricity. The bad news, of course, is hydrogen is flammable. And the other mm, mixed news is hydrogen doesn't lift all that much more than helium. Helium's already so light. What's, you know, why, you know, going to nothing is not a, with no weight at all is, is not a big difference. Okay? Um, just to remind you, last time I was, we, were, we were burning another lighter than air gas, which is, which is methane. Uh, natural gas is, is, is methane, it's carbon, carbon H4, CH4, um, a carbon atom with four hydrogens decorating it, and it weighs about half as much as the average uh, air, air uh, molecule. So it's, it doesn't lift as much as helium, but again, it lifts a fair amount. So you can make a balloon, fill it with, with methane, natural gas, and you can float stuff around. Um, okay? All right. Having said all that, let me go back to what, one of the questions that, that, that people were asking was, uh, psych, uh, t tornadoes, you know, how, how do they form? And I told you that, that uh, I gave you two cents about them, but let me, let me make, make it clearer still. Because, of course, tornadoes are part of life, and you might as well have some clue of, of how they work. And I'll give you the physicist's point of view. I'm not, certainly not an expert in, in, uh, in, in weather and winds and stuff like that. But here's, here's how a physicist would look at tornadoes. And, and you know enough to understand all of this. Suppose you have air flowing along like this in one region. We're looking down on the, on the, on the region. So, so we're looking down like this, watching the air go by. And up here, the air is going this way. And for some reason, there's air nearby going the other way. And how would this happen? This would happen where you've got pressure differences that cause the air to get started. The differences in pressure, as you will see, and do more and more, cause gas to flow. Air will flow towards lower pressure because it's pushed harder by the high, high pressure in one direction, less by the low pressure. Who wins? The high pressure wins, and the air in between them goes, accelerates toward the low pressure. And it accelerates and it accumulates momentum in that direction. And there are issues about keeping fluids flowing is complicated because they tend to rub against themselves, e each other, and experience uh, slowing effects like friction. But basically, if you've got a big pressure difference, you can get the air coasting along pretty well from high pressure to low pressure. It may not keep speeding up, but it at least get going fast. So you can have a situation where the air here is, is roaring to the left because of its accumulated leftward momentum, and the air at another region is roaring to the right because it's accumulated momentum. And in the, in the junction between them, which I will mark here with a dotted line so you can see it. I'm, I'm having trouble seeing it myself. In that region, there is a rotation to the air. If I, if I draw, if I take a loop around here like this, uh, sort of, and look at, look at, at, at the air in this loop, and I, I'm actually going to, I did a terrible job here. <laughs> Artist not. Um, 
and plan ahead. If you, if you look, call this a center, the, the air below that, that center is roaring to the left, above that center is roaring to the right, it's swirling. It's got, a, it's got a swirling character to it. Is that okay? Suppose, so you've got the air swirling. I can't stand the rest of this. It's offending me. So let's just look at that, that ring around a center. So I made a ring here. And the ring has, it's got a, it's got a swirling character like that. Top is heading to right, bottom is heading to left. It's, it's moving like this. That ring has angular momentum. It's got angular momentum clockwise as you look at it, which is officially into the board, which is down, but who cares, OK? So far, so good. That's just, you know, angular momentum shows up in, in, in flows of, of fluids. What happens if something sucks the air out of the center? Well, if that happens, you know, why would that happen? It's a hot spot. If it's, hot, if it's heated there, we've already seen hot air is buoyant and cold air. Um, one of the features of that methane bubble fun and games last time was, if I, if I blew a, a perfect methane bubble with a, with a skin on it, it floated up, it's buoyant in air, right? It, it weighs less than the air displaces, up it goes and you can light it. If the bubble popped, the blob of methane still floated up, it's still buoyant. So methane, the lighter than air gases, are buoyant in, in ordinary air with or without a skin. They go. And so if you heat up the air at the center of my ring, which actually is not part of the ring, it's, it's, it's in the middle of the ring, if you heat it up, it's going to rise. And the details of the rising on grand scales is, is a little more complicated than just being a, 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 a hot air balloon rising, but same idea. And so if it rises out of the center, it leaves emptiness behind it. Where is it going to? How's it going to fill? The ring is pushed inward. The pressure there drops in the center, having lost some of its weight. So the pressure goes down. And the air in the ring flows inward. And as the air flows inward, pushed in by the higher pressure outside, it's got rotational mass, and it's got angular momentum, and its rotational mass is shrinking. It's doing the skater trick. It's pulling its arms in, and it spins faster and faster. And so that's what, what prompts these, these vortices in the, in, in the Earth's atmosphere, is air rushing toward a center already, with that air already loaded with an angular momentum. And as its rotational mass shrinks, it's got to spin faster. OK? Physicist's view of, of, of cyclones and hurricanes. All right, last question from last time. And this was, or the one, yeah. Why doesn't the air pressure change in a building? So here's the idea. So, so, so suppose we got, we got a, a, a box-shaped building. And let's look above the roof for a moment. So here's, here is the building. It's got, you know, it's going down there. Here's the building. Here's the, off the building. The air pressure here and the air pressure there are the same. Uh, in this case, the building is supporting the weight of the column of air above it at this point. And from there on up, the, the air is uh, supporting the air, is supporting the air, is supporting the air, and so on. And over here, there's no building, but the air below it is supporting it. So the, so the building is doing the job of the air, the same job as the air would be doing if the building weren't there. It's pushing up on the column of air and supporting its weight. This is above the building. It's not a big, impressive surprise. OK? Let me get this out of the way for a second. What about inside the building? So, I mean, so what's the, what's the bottom line there? The air pressure on the top of the building is exactly the same as the air pressure adjacent to the building at the same altitude. You, the, air, the air a little above those two layers can't tell a difference. Can't tell whether it's above air, or open air, or whether it's above a building. No difference. In the building, things are different. Let's, let's completely seal the building initially. So not only is it a building, box-shaped building, has all the windows closed, everything's closed. In which case, when you go into that building, the structure of the building can be responsible for supporting the column of air going off to the top of the atmosphere. So the roof is, is holding up the column of air. And what's going on inside the building is adjustable. For example, you can take all the air out of it. The, the building may not like this. It won't. But it will, it will work. You can, have no you can have no air, zero air inside that building. 
and allow the roof to do all the support of the air from, from then on up. And it, it all works out. You have all, it's at equilibrium, everything's great. Okay? No problem. If you do put a little bit of air inside the building, it will develop a pressure gradient because of gravity, but it may be very, the, the pressures at any given height may be very different from the pressure outside because there's no longer a responsibility to support the column of air going to the top of the atmosphere. That's the building's job. So you can have any pressure you want, there will be a gradient in it because of gravity, but that's side. The issue comes now is what happens when you open a window? As soon as you open any window anywhere in the building, the, the low pressure inside and the high pressure outside will, will have a battle. The high pressure will win. It will cause air to accelerate into the building and fill the building back up until inside the building, the pressures at, 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 the, at altitude inside the building and altitude outside the building, they'll be the same. You will have erased all the fun, and it'll happen very fast. So when the, once, once you've opened the building, the roof will know, no, the roof will still be responsible for holding up the column of air, but it will have help from below by the, by the column of air below it. And it will pretty much all the support provided by the roof will be given to it by the air below the roof, inside the building, now, as, now that the building's full of air. Is that okay? So I actually have a demonstration for this. All right. It wasn't designed for this purpose, but it exactly fits the bill. Right now, the column of the air above this pipe it has this pressure gradient in it. The pipe is supporting that column of air above it, and the air inside the pipe is supporting the pipe, which is supporting the air. It all works out nicely. The pressure inside the pipe is a little bit less than the pressure above the pipe, tiny, tiny bit, but, but basically it's it. Now, if I take away the air inside, which I'm going to do, now the pipe itself will be responsible for supporting that column of air, and the pipe will be working hard to do this, okay? There will be, it'll have no help from the air inside because there isn't any. But as soon as we open the window, the air will rush in and, and go back to business as usual, like, like it is now. Is that okay? I need someone to help me with this because there are two ends to the pipe. And the person at, at this, at, okay, Alex, you can come on up. All right. Along with taking all the air out of the pipe, we're going to put a ball in it at this end. You're, you're, you're at this end, actually, because I'm going to, I'll close that in. You have to hold this plug here while the pressure, we're going to suck the air out. I'll get it started here. Whoops. Here is, uh, uh, like this. Nope. There. Ha <laughs> ha. I'm going to seal the other end. So we're sealing both ends of the... There we go. We're sealing both ends of this pipe. I can let go now, can I? Yeah. Okay, you can let go there. It's, it's going to be held. It's he the rubber's plug, the plugs are both held in place by the pressure imbalance now. There's atmospheric pressure outside. Getting close to zero inside, there are huge forces pushing those two, sur those two surfaces into place and keeping the seal. And we're, I'm watching the pressure go down. What, once we get this and seal it off, there'll be no pressure inside the, and no air, no density inside the container. There is a rubber ball over here, I will remind you. And what Alex is going to do is knock that stopper off with a mallet. Okay? And when he does that, there will be a huge pressure imbalance between the air outside, which is the atmospheric pressure, and nothing inside. The air will rush in there, and it will reach speeds of about 200 miles an hour. Um, and that plug on that end will come, out of, come off just in time for the ball to go by at 200 miles an hour toward the wall. And we used to do this with apples, and it would make applesauce ring mess pretty much the whole wall and the front row, and maybe the second row. So we stopped doing that. But this will also launch baseballs. We made, I made it for, for, a, for a show on ba TV show on baseballs. Uh, uh, on, it was actually football, but we were shooting baseballs 500 feet. It was lots of fun. Okay, we've got it, the pressure's down low enough. I'm going to seal this off. We're pretty good. It's, that's about as good as we're going to get, I think. Okay. And now you can just, just, just knock it off. Where did it? 
I'm not convinced. Where did that thing go? I don't think it made the trip it was supposed to make. Let me try this. We've got to do this again. Has to, have to. It's physics. Right, okay. okay. Uh, you, you hold that there. Where's the box? The box is gone. Come back, box. That was inadequately. Are you? Do we, we don't seem to have a good seal. Somebody's leaking. There you go. That's better. This definitely works better if we get a full vacuum that is essentially zero molecules inside. And I think I was short on, the, our vacuum was inadequate. Why is it stopping at 27? That just doesn't seem right. Yeah, we'll try it one more time here. Let me, let me, let me, let, let, me go, let it go for, until it stops moving. So this gauge is telling me how good a vacuum there is. It's comparing the atmosphere, atmospheric pressure with the pressure inside the container, and it's, it's uh, trying to go towards 30 units there is, is full vacuum. It's about as good as we're going to go. Okay. That was better. <laughs> Thanks, Alex. All right. All right. Yeah. So we use, we use a mushy ball because of obvious problems with a, with a hard ball. We used to also used to shoot, shoot hard balls into a box full of uh, telephone books. But telephone books, of course, went, went away. The other thing was it would, it would shoot, it would, it would punch a deep hole into that box with a baseball. So baseballs are dangerous. OK, you understand the physics of why that happened? Is that OK? All right. <laughs> Did you win three Emmys? The answer is actually yes. But they're, they're regional Emmys. They're not national. Oh, well. <sighs> um, <laughs> it is fun to have done something crazy like that. I'll, at some point, I'll bring some of the television show pieces in here and play them, because they're, when they're relevant. OK. What ha happens to pressure when you open a window in a plane? Ah, if you're at high altitude, the air around you at high altitude is, is of course, very low density, very low pressure, very low temperature, all because it's worked its way up in the stack. And it's not good for people, so they pressurize planes, right? The planes are, they, they pump air into the planes. Um, to, to, to pack it more tightly. The amazing thing is that they do that through the engines of the planes, and we'll talk about how jet engines work. They bring the air in through the, through the engines. The engines are the compressor for it. And as a result of compressing it, they have to, actually, they have to chill the air, which is a bizarre thing, but they, but they do. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that, too. Anyhow, so the, air is full, the plane is full of compressed air, basically, from the perspective of the surrounding passing birds or something. If you open a hole in the plane, the air is going to accelerate out like crazy. And the pressure inside, the, the number of molecules inside the plane will, will plummet, and with it, the density, and with it, the, pr uh, the pressure. So once in a while, there's an accident where the plane's depressurized, and there is just a sudden loss of, of, of gas from inside the plane. It can be, a, you know, it's a problem if anybody gets in, in the way of it. And, and alas, people do. They end up getting blown out of the plane by this, ru this rush of air. But the other thing is that now that it's suddenly low density air, it doesn't support life well. And therefore, they try, one, one issue is that they try to give you more uh, dense, they try to replace the air with oxygen. Because what you really need when you're breathing is oxygen, not, not air. And so giving you this more concentrated version of gas at the same pressure and essentially the same density is, is, a, is, a, is a big aid. But in fact, once, once a plane depressurizes, protocol is to, is to descend like crazy. So uh, the, the, the most, most of what you will notice is the plane suddenly decides we're not going to be flying at 35,000 feet anymore. We've lost pressure. We're going to be at 20,000 feet now. And so it's a, it's a deep descent. OK? 
All right. I think that, yeah, that gets, gets my whole story on balloons, a lot of time on that too. Okay, water. Same, it's actually the same story, a lot of the same story. Uh, we'll get some new tools with it. And things to notice about, about water, of course, it develops this pressure gradient just like air does, so the pressure's higher down low than it is up high. Um, water, like air, accelerates toward lower pressure. So if you have high pressure at one place, low pressure at another, the water will go. So how do you pressurize water? Well, water, in, air, it's hard, you can pressurize it, it's harder, you need, a, you need to trap it in something like a sealed container. Well, water, I'm gonna trap in a sealed container. This, so this is full of water, not air. And if I push in on the skin of this plastic flexible device, uh, bottle, if I push in on it, uh, I'm exerting an inward force on a certain amount of surface area, I'm actually Putting, applying a pressure to the outside of the bottle. And my pressure, it's not very big pressure, but it's enough. And yet it's at equilibrium right now. The bottle's sealed. It's at equilibrium. How could that be? If I'm pushing inward and have, have created this pressure inward, how come it, it's the skin of the bottle is not accelerating? And the answer is because the water also developed a pressure and it's pushing outward equally hard. So if I push inward with 10 units of pressure, the water pushes outward with 10 units of pressure. Or, or I should say, if I develop 10 units of pressure, the water develops 10 units of pressure. We're both fighting over the same skin, and no one's making progress. However, if I, if I pull the cap off the bottle, the fact that this water now has 10 units of pressure that it didn't have before will become immediately evident, right? Up it goes. The water accelerated now from high pressure in the bottle, pressurized by me, to low pressure out here, that is atmospheric pressure. It accelerated in doing that. And once it accelerated that way, it kept on going. And so, it's, so it sprays. And one thing you can notice from this is that in addition to pressurizing the water, making it move, I gave it energy. Because I was pushing inward on the water, as the water flowed, it basically the water moved in the direction of my push. And I did work on it. And the work showed up first as kinetic energy right here, and later as gravitational potential energy as the water got higher. So suddenly this story is going to drift from just pushing in and to an energy story. Um, energy suddenly becomes important in this story. And what was happening was I was essentially pumping water and there are other ways of pumps. We've got, we've got more, more th this kind of pump, of course, you can't sustain it very long. I can squeeze it for a while and I run out of water and then I'm not much of a water delivery system, which is the, the topic of the day. Um, but there are pumps that can refill themselves. Like, a, like this piston, this is just a simple piston pump. This pump can draw water into a sealed container which, as I pull the syringe out and then it can deliver the water. So it's just, I can keep, pumping like that. But each time I'm doing this pumping activity, I'm doing work. I'm exerting a force on the plunger as it moves in the direction of my force. And the, 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 the key point, and I've got method in my madness here, trying to where I want to go. The key point is that pumping water takes energy. And I've, I've showed you already that, that you can do work on a solid object by exerting a force on it and having it move a distance in the direction of your force. You can also do a work on a solid object by twisting it with a torque and having it rotate an angle in the direction of your torque. And here's another example. You can exert a pressure on a fluid and have the fluid flow, in, in a, deliver a certain volume of fluid and do work on it. Uh, it turns, the work you do is actually the pressure of the fluid times the volume uh, that flows. It, it all works out in units. It's the same as force times distance, torque times angle, pressure times volume. They all work out. So pumping water takes energy. And as a result, water can have three forms of energy that are interesting to pay attention to. Kinetic, of course, when, when it's moving. Gravitational, potential when it's up high. And a third type of energy that's associated with its pressure, and it has to do with the need to pump, to do work to pump water. 
If you're going to be pumping water all day and delivering gallons and gallons and gallons of it at a certain pressure, that water traveling along is, is effectively carrying energy with it in its pressure. It's, it's a little bit of a swindle and a, uh, it's not quite perfect, but pressure, you, we can think of a pressure of potential energy where water under pressure is, is, has energy with it. It's, it, it. The detail is that it comes from the delivery service, not from the water itself, but it's there anyway. Pressurized water is, has, can, do, can do things. And you've seen this, that pressurized water washes stuff or um, moves water up into a tank. So the pressure, pressure potential energy is, the, is a sec, the third form of energy. So I want those three, gravitational potential energy, pressure potential energy, and kinetic energy. And water in delivery systems trades one of those energies for the other. Remember, energy as a, as a whole is conserved, but the individual parts of it aren't. One can trade into the other. And so where I'm going with this is, is, is I'll show you. And, and that, that ability to trade energy from one form to the other, you've heard tell of as Bernoulli's equation. Bernoulli's equation seems like some esoteric, what, what the hell is this? It's an, it's an equation that says in certain circumstances that I'll flesh out next time, the energy in a drop of water, in each drop of water flowing through a, a, a system, is, is in total is constant, but it can trade between three forms. Gravitational, pressure, poten gravitational potential, pressure potential, and kinetic. So here is a simple demonstration of water moving its energy from one form to the other. It's going to start with gravitational potential energy. This tank is full of water. I'm doing work lifting the water up. I just packed it full of gravitational potential energy. That energy is going to become pressure potential energy as the water goes down inside a, a, a pipe. That pressure gradient that builds up, there's energy associated with it. So the pressure potential energy will hit a maximum down here. The water will then come up a little bit and go through a nozzle. And the nozzle has a neat, neat trick. It turns pressure potential energy into kinetic energy. So the water will come out, make a mess. The water will come out traveling uh, fast. It will rise to the, I can't get it to go. Okay, I gotta just force it. it it's, it's, it's going from kinetic back to gravitational potential, back to kinetic. So the energy is going from gravitational potential energy to pressure potential energy to kinetic energy to gravitational potential energy, to kinetic energy. It's going through all the transitions, all right? Now, the energy started at, with this height, and we're out of water, okay. But we have a second container. It's up there, all right? Must have mess. There's a lot of air in the system, so it's gonna take a while for the air to go out. Here it goes. So, get, there we go, all right. So it's going from gravitational to pressure potential energy, to kinetic, to gravitational, back to kinetic. All right. And with that, I'll stop. We'll, there, there are a few more demonstrations that'll wait till next time. All right. <laughs>